Uber cars, gone. They'll be gone with self-driving vehicles, etc., etc., etc. Now, progress is excellent. We should never, ever stop progress. But for the first time now, what a lot of people are thinking is that many, many jobs are going to go away and not necessarily be replaced. And so this is also a very important thing that we've got to think about. So when we think about the future of education, we've got to think about education in this world. What are we actually doing to develop people who can cope in this world? Because in this world, you know, we all grew up memorizing. It happens in all of our schools around the country. In the Bloom's Taxonomy of Learning, it's the lowest form of learning. And this is education in South Africa today. It's education across Africa. Teacher stands up, get a textbook, get your highlighter, summarize, memorize, regurgitate, parrot. Okay? Those jobs just simply, I don't even know if they still exist, but they definitely will not exist. And not BEE and not anything will save them, they will be gone. Okay? From being a chef, which will also probably disappear at a certain point. People think it's a luxury to go to a restaurant where it's actually cooked by human beings. But other than that, almost every area that we can think of is going to disappear um, if it's in terms of manual labor, etc. So think about why South Africa needs to leapfrog and think about our reality. Whatever the unemployment number is, whatever all those things are, um, if you look at that little triangle on the right there, out of 100 kids that enter grade one into this huge machine for regurgitation and parrot fashion learning, okay, less than 50 make it to matric. So even with parrot fashion, they still can't make it to matric. Okay, and then of that, maybe 28 or so are going to pass matric to 35. Of that, 5 to 10 are going to go into higher education. Of that, 1 to 3 are going to graduate. Okay? So just think about that. Out of 100 of our precious little kids in this country who go bright and bushy-tailed into grade 1, and their mom drops them off at school, one, two, three of them are going to maybe get a higher degree, are going to get a higher education. Not that that's that important, but it is certainly important. And um, I just want to compare that. For example, two years ago, my wife and I went to India. We went to Bangalore. Um, we went to go visit Wipro. 146,000 people working in the company around the world. On this one campus in Bangalore, right next to HP and Dell and everybody else, they've got 14,000 PhDs in computer science. How many PhDs in computer science have we got in this room tonight? Come waiting? Still waiting? Okay, master's degrees in computer science? Interesting. One company has got 14,000 PhDs. They've got 380 professors of computer science that they've stolen from all of India's universities, along with everybody else like all of their other competitors, Infosys and everybody else. In the whole of South Africa, we don't have anything close to 14,000 PhDs. In the whole country, that is one company, just one, okay? So we must think about if we have to leapfrog, how on earth are we going to do it, okay? Into this technological era um, and, and compete with the rest of the world. I'm not gonna go through these statistics. This is just a graph that I often show because it's interesting, this shows the South African economy and it shows what is going on in South Africa today. 54 million people in our population. The right hand bar there shows the number of people who are actually working. Only about 13 million in the formal sector of the economy. Of that, only about 5.5 to 6 million are earning enough to pay taxes. Okay? So just think that 5.5 to 6 million people pay tax. Where does government get all of its money from? It doesn't come from government other than a few bribes maybe here and there and th things like that, government gets its money from you and me and all of us that pay taxes. Five and a half to six million of us are supporting 17 million people on social welfare grants, okay? 27,000 high schools and primary schools, 12 million kids going through the public school system effectively for free, we paying for that, okay? All the hospitals, all the clinics, etc. I think you can see it's a very, very unsustainable picture. Now you go back to that thing about the end of work, and you think how many of those people who are working are going to lose their jobs, then we really realize, boy, we better get very creative about how we think about education, talent development, etc. And that is what I'm going to talk about tonight. 
So this was something that we set out to do. When I decided not to emigrate and, and went into um, Alex Township for four and a half years and Soweto and worked in primary schools and high schools and so on, the most amazing time of my life. Um, and, and we saw that incredible kids were, we were able to get their pass rates up a lot in the schools, but then they would come out of school and then they'd end up on the streets. They couldn't even pay the registration fee to go to university. And we thought, gee, that's unfair because if you're a kid in Rialochile High or Alex Secondary or something like that, chances are you don't have 6,000 or 8,000 Rand to pay a registration fee for university. And that's when we started to think about this idea and we saw these kids just ending up doing nothing. Maybe they'd go scan barcodes in a supermarket, um, something low level, and we just thought, could a street kid, for us that was just a metaphor, could a street kid become an engineer, a chartered accountant, a software developer, a PhD, could they do anything? Okay, And that's really what we set out to prove, which was just a journey about human development. And could human beings actually do this? And it's a very interesting thing because I'm going to show you some research which shows why maybe it's harder than we think, but I'm going to show you some research which shows that it's actually possible. Now, this was a terrible picture, and I'm not very good at, at PowerPoint and so on. And um, I'm going to talk more about an IT revolution, but what we need alongside this IT revolution is human evolution. And we need human evolution at much faster pace than we've ever, ever, ever had it before. And, and, and so we went from, I remember my first 286 computer, or XT, then a 286, then a 386, then a 486, and it was so exciting. Pentium 1, do you remember Pentium 1 computer? How exciting, eh? And now, I mean, imagine if someone gave you a Pentium 1, you'd think they're like trying to attack you with a knife or something like that. And, but how do we do this to human beings? How do we take a human being from an XT to a 286, to a 386, to a 486? Because a lot of our population, let's be absolutely honest, coming through our school system, are still XTs, okay? They're still 286s at best, or 386s. If you test somebody on just matric level maths and English, forget it if they've got a matric. We've tested thousands of kids over the years going through this regurgitation system. They're not even grade nine. Most of them are grade four to grade nine, with the majority being about grade six or grade seven, but they've got a matric certificate, okay? So our technology is going like this, and where are people going, okay? It's a very, very interesting mismatch, okay? So, so, so this is something that I think, as we think about this IT revolution, we really have to think about the human evolution that has to go along with it if this is going to be actually what we hope it's going to be. Now let's think about a human being. We're different to computers. We're different to computers. We're similar to computers in many ways. We've got RAM, we've got ROM, we've got everything that a computer's got, but we've also got these other things as well, aside from a body and a senses and mind, which maybe we can argue a computer's got, and intellect, but now we start to go into feelings, ego, consciousness, okay? These are levels of a human being that maybe a computer doesn't have, okay? So when we're thinking about this human evolution, how do we evolve a human being on all those levels? Because education as we know it has been stuck on one parallel there, which is just the intellect, okay? If you were top of the class uh, in, in, in your school, you had a good intellect, maybe you were just a particularly good parrot, um, and, 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 and so on. And where have those people ended up? They're not sitting in this room. I bet you no one sitting in this room was top in their class at school, okay? Which is a great compliment to all of you. And if you did come top, <laughs> please step out of the room. You should not be in this talk, okay? Because if I think back to the people who were top of the class in my school and the year behind me and so on, they never built anything, okay? And, and uh, so, I just wanted to share with you a little bit and quickly and show a short video about the work that we do and how we're thinking about just this metaphor of this journey of can a street kid be a PhD, an engineer, a programmer, anything, okay? So I'm gonna talk about our three use cases, things that I'm very busy with every day. The one is the Marishi Institute. It's a radical approach to running a business school where all the students do yoga and meditation and all kinds of things focused on developing greatness as opposed to just learning statistics or strategy or marketing and so on. National Virtual Incubator is a project that I was, well, developed with government. I was asked to chair a national government task team about four and a half years ago by the former deputy president on entrepreneurship and how could we bring about job creation. 
And it's led to two very interesting projects that I thought you would be very interested in, in how we're thinking about using technology in supporting all the small businesses in the country, and how can we use technology to help create a more useful school system, so that the school system actually starts to wake up a little bit. In the Marish Institute, what is our target? Our target is to develop 100,000 leaders. We think leadership is everything. Leadership is everything. Think about the different presidents we've had, okay? Just as a perfect example, okay? So how do we develop a next generation of young people who can be the leaders who are gonna take South Africa to the country that we all want it to be? So I'm just gonna show you a quick video about the Marishi Institute. It's just five minutes. My name is Jacob Sonomari. I'm a Marishi Institute student. I'm a fourth year student. My name is Gabelo. I come from Alex and I'm 26 years old. My name is Conscious Kasana. Um, I am a final year student in the Maharishi Institute and I work as a marketing intern. I grew up in Chartwell, just north of Johannesburg, um, near London's area. Alex is, is, is compressed and there's a lot of people living in, in, in one place. Everybody shares a yard and they share uh, amenities. We didn't have um, good role models in high school. The people who you looked up to were mostly the guys who hang around the car washes or the corners, the gangsters and stuff. We found criminals to be heroes and we looked up to them. It's a society where education is not important. There's not much that you can do outside of just working in a menial job. You're very lucky when you get um, an education or you get to further your education, like go to university or college. It felt like I was also going to go and be a cashier or go and work in the bar until a family friend uh, called me and told me about the institute. I heard about the Marish Institute on the radio. And one of the people that work here were talking about inviting students to come through for an open day. And I came to Maharish Institute when Dr. P was talking. What he said really resonated with me because he was offering free education, something that my father wanted me to do. He always encouraged us to get education. You can change your life. You can, you are, you have that potential. You, you can become something great. And I found that I, I really want to be part of it. So I applied and I wrote the test and I was lucky enough to get chosen. Getting into the institute, everyone was friendly. They treated each other like a family. People who want to know more about you, people care. You used to a place where nobody cared whether you came to class, whether you are there or not. It doesn't matter. I started learning transcendental meditation, started doing yoga. It helped me discover myself and what I wanted and how I was going to get it. The whole attitude towards life and towards education changed because I was now more focused. I was now prepared to change and become a greater person. It's given us that, that confidence, that extra boost, and the energy. I now knew who I was and what I wanted. I value myself more because of, of what it does to me. Next year I would like to, to get an internship in an accounting firm because I would really love to pursue a, a career in accounting. I'm looking forward to going into corporate where I am hoping that I'll be of value to any organization that I'm going to be involved in. I want to become a management consultant with one of the top management consultants uh, companies in the world and hopefully become a professor one day. So I want to get a PhD and teach at university when I'm, when I'm much older. But hopefully I can also come back and teach here when, when I become a professor. I would also like to give back to the community through education. I want to become the role model that I never had back in high school where I can go back to my high school in the community and say, look, you don't have to end up here. Um, there's a better life out there. All you have to do is just be committed, be focused on education.
So what's interesting about the Marish Institute from a technological point of view, one of the things that's interesting is that the students are doing an American degree and the professors are literally 14,000 kilometers away, eight hour time difference, and every single day in the afternoon, in the late afternoon, students are doing classes, and it's, this is not actually asynchronous learning, this is live synchronous learning, um, and these are professors in the US um, teaching every single day in the morning, it's, it's morning for them. Now what's interesting about it, and I'm gonna talk about, so it's, it's just this year it was ranked the third top MBA in America, um, online MBA, and um, students are doing a bachelor's degree. But so a few years ago, MIT did some research, and what they found is for the kind of students that we're helping, there's usually about a 90% dropout rate in distance learning, okay? So one of the things that we've been experimenting with, what's great about this education, firstly, is we can open up campuses anywhere. So we're opening up in Durban now, we can go anywhere, we wanna to go to various places in Africa, et cetera, et cetera, and we know that technology allows that. It allows people to get learning absolutely anywhere, and it's much lower cost, and, and, and things like that. It's also great because one can have very high quality education. It's great because the students are getting a degree that people from 100 countries around the world are getting, and they can go anywhere in the world to work with it. Um, it's a 112,000 US dollar degree, we do not pay that, um, but um, that's a very valuable education that they're getting. But, but what's interesting is that we've got the reverse of that. So instead of 90% dropping out, we're finding through this third model of creating a human interface to technology-enabled learning, we're able to get very, very high pass rates, job placement rates, getting students in, into the economy. And why I wanna talk about that is because I'm gonna keep on talking about this thing of technology together with people, and how do we marry these things, create this kind of human interface, it, it, et cetera. The other interesting thing about this uh, approach to learning, it's called consciousness-based, and the whole thing is about developing the student from within. How do you wake the student up? How do you make them alert and receptive, et cetera, rather than, in fact, the exams here are open book. You can bring in any books you like, Google, whatever you wanna do, Bing, sorry, uh, anything you want to do, and, and, and so on. And I uh, hope no one's here from Microsoft, but um, anyway, I love Microsoft. They're a wonderful sponsor of ours, and we're very grateful. Okay, so why, why is this important? It's important because here we are, just in a building in downtown Joburg, and then soon in Durban, and we can do it absolutely anywhere. Just look at the economics of how this changes the life of one of those young people you saw in that video. You saw three people in that video. One of them is now in the States doing their master's degree. The other one is working at Accenture, one of 73 of our graduates working at Accenture, the one who wanted to work in an accounting firm. And, and the third one is, is, is working in a company called Manpower Group as an IT recruitment specialist. Okay, so now all of these students came from nowhere. Okay, like from very, that, that girl who's working at Accenture now, she's from Bethel, she spoke on the video about she could have worked in a mine or got pregnant, you know, it was kind of two options for a young woman there. But if you look at what's likely to happen to her now and beyond that, if we track the lifetime expected earnings of one of these graduates, and we've now had many thousands of them in the market, we estimate that a graduate should earn about 10 million rand over their working careers, conservatively. Okay, you're talking over a 35 to 40 year period, provided they can get a good job, keep learning, stay employed, etc., which we know is tough, okay? But 10 million rand, the value of the education is actually about 1.8 million that they get. If they had to pay to go to a normal university, it would be about 400,000. Our cost for four years of university plus a bridging program is 117,000. The students pay 200 rand a month. For 200 rand, they're getting this degree that's $112,000, learnership, specializations, all these different areas, lunch every day, clothing, they get counseling, mentorship, leadership courses, goes on and on and on. Just had 114 of them specializing with SAP to become SAP consultants, that's a 25,000 US dollar course and so on. They're paying 200 rand a month, okay? So in a year they're paying 2,000. I always say to my friends, if you've got little kids, I've got a little baby now, it's one year and two months. We're starting to find out how much creches cost. You do not want to know what creches cost, okay? So I say to my friends, take your child out of creche, wasting a lot of money, a lot of time, put them into university, can pay 200 rand a month. Okay, so the return on investment for one of these students is 100,000%, okay? For their 200 rand a month that they're paying, 
they're going to end up earning 10 million rand. That's 100,000% return on investment for them. That's why education matters. It changes everything. Because if you're going to earn that 10 million rand, you're going to be in the middle class, you're going to live in a nice house, you're going to have health care, you're going to take care of your children, you're going to make choices, you've got dignity. We've now put over 15,000, the video is a little bit old, um, into jobs. We have a 98% job placement rate. Um, these are all kids, generally, who would not get into university. 20% of them have got a matric exemption matric, and the other 80% don't. They would not be allowed into a conventional university. And through bridging, we're able to get them through a degree and into the economy. So again, it's just this idea of could anybody do anything? But the exciting thing is we track the their, uh, their, their annual salaries, where they're working. We estimate conservatively they're now close to a billion on over 900 million rand in salaries. We estimate that they'll earn over 23 billion. Okay, and that is very conservative. It sounds like a big number. We actually can show why that is actually very conservative. I'm not going to spend time on this. I'm not going to spend time on this. This is our building in downtown Joburg. Um, these are some of the things that make this approach unique because we're trying to create the first self-funding university in the world with no money from government and the students are just paying that turnaround a month. So if you think of our conventional universities, something like WITS, um, Beautiful university, I studied at WITS, they get over 4 billion rand a year from government, okay? We get zero. So we have to work out how can we do these things on, on no money. And I'll talk about some of the ways we do that. Okay, we won a global award um, as the most innovative education institution in the world in 2010, it was on CNN and so on. This is where we're trying to get to. And technology is gonna play a critical role in us being able to do this. But with this very, very interesting and unique model that I'm gonna talk more about. So, 15,000 graduates, we think, will affect 100,000 people and family members. 100,000 will change a million lives. If they each earn 100,000 rand starting salaries, that is 10 billion rand together. Over the course of their working careers, we think that they could earn between 640 billion up to 1 trillion rand in lifetime earnings. Okay? So education matters. Rather than these kids being on the streets, doing absolutely nothing with their lives, as we saw in the video there, just doing something to develop their brains, to learn something, to be competent, to be able to do things, that is worth a lot of money to those families and, and how it changes their lives. How are we funding it? Three ways. The first way is we've got a model called pay it forward and learn and earn. So all the students work while they study at university, and then when they graduate, they just have to pay back 600 rand a month provided they're working. If they're unemployed, they never have to pay us back because then we have not helped them. Okay, so in this way, every cent we get goes back to fund another student. The second method is we're using black economic empowerment. Companies have to do BE anyway. We're saying do BE in a way that creates a true broad base, has got 100,000% return on investment, and that can change the lives of a lot of people. And it's wonderful to have Sean Neen here, idea engineers, and we've got your run there from DSG, and we're lucky to be their BE partner because a quarter of their profits go towards funding this for, for, for kids to get an education. So those are some of the partners. FCB, you might know. We just had a partnership with them, with SAP, and so on. I'm hoping Microsoft hears this as well. Okay. <laughs> the other thing we do, the third thing, is we run a call center. Uh, we're doing this, in, in fact, in partnership with uh, Yaron and DSG. But the idea is that we, anywhere we can create a campus, we can create outsourcing work that the students can do while they're studying. So that's some of the ways that we're creating these self-funding universities, but technology at the heart of it. Branson Center of Entrepreneurship, we started 10 years ago with Sir Richard Branson, an amazing, incredible, unbelievable entrepreneur that I think all of us love, and it's been incredible getting to know him. And, uh, and we started something that was just to take kids again off the streets and try and teach them how to build their own businesses. And in the beginning, it failed and failed and failed, and trying to learn how to do it and been getting better and better and better at it, and now many, many, many thousands of businesses have started. And this has now gone global. But the exciting thing about it is how we're using technology to take it global. And, and a platform that's now been created so that people all over the world can get mentors anywhere in the world to, to help grow their business. So that's another use case. So next use case of how we're thinking about using technology is this work that we got asked to do for government. Okay, so... We started to think about it. Okay, so the question that government asked us is, can't we take all these unemployed youth that just on the streets, millions and millions of youth, 
can't they all become entrepreneurs and start their own businesses and become successful? And the sad answer that we all know is no. Okay, we wish it was true, but we've done tons and tons of research. We took over 700 studies on entrepreneurship and small business in South Africa to see, is this possible? And uh, what we found is it isn't possible. On the back of that kind of education where people can hardly read and write, do basic maths, you know, et cetera, creativity has been so suppressed, um, et, et cetera, people have actually been discouraged to be entrepreneurs, it, it's highly unlikely. However, small business is the backbone of this economy. 70% of all jobs in the formal sector of South Africa are actually in a small business of less than 50 people. Some of those are here tonight. That is where jobs are created in South Africa. It's not in Barclays or ABSA or FNB or anyone like that or Vodacom, et cetera. So small business is the gold of this country. How do we make small businesses strong and powerful? And we thought, we looked at all the government incubators, which are these physical incubators. There's over 60 of them now. They cost hundreds of millions of rands per year to run under the auspices of CEDA, but they're not effective. And we said, how do we reach you know, all in all, in total, all those incubators, over 60 of them are reaching less than 10,000 businesses per year being incubated. We've got about 6 million small businesses if you include all the informal sector and, and, and so on. 1.35 million registered businesses with CIPC. So we said, how are we going to reach them? We're going to reach them through mobile because every small business has got a mobile phone in their pockets. And we started developing this concept called a national virtual incubator. The first thing we launched was free websites. You probably heard of that was online initiative. We got 65,000 small businesses to create a free website which you could create over a mobile phone, etc. Second thing we launched was with Regenesis, that slightly bigger businesses could get access to an MBA for free, a bachelor's degree in business for free, a postgraduate diploma in management for free. Half a million South Africans have accessed that, and you can go to the website and look at it. The third thing we launched is called finfindeasy.coza, and Microsoft's very involved in that initiative, but it's so that every small business can find access to finance. And everyone who's running a business knows how hard it is to access finance. Even if you know what you're doing, it is hard to access finance. And you don't know, should you go to the IDC? Should you go to the NEF? Should you go to CEDA? Should you go to CIFA? Should you go to SASFIN? Should you go to Standard Bank? Where should you go? This is a tool that helps you decide where you should go um, in order to find how to get funding. And it's just been launched, and we've now got over 15,000 people have so far have, have used it to, 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 to try and find funding for their business. Something we're doing with Microsoft that's extremely exciting, as well as called YouthWorks, something that we're growing, which is to try to help all these unemployed youth through mobile to find how to become an entrepreneur, get career guidance. There's over 1,000 free courses on the site. They get points for doing all kinds of things and so on. And that's also an app that you could look at, youthworks.mobi, and something very exciting that Microsoft is doing. 